So now I'm recording and hopefully Ariana is recording too. So thank you everyone for joining us today on this uh, new webinar that we are doing uh, with OpenGLAM, the uh, copyright community at Europeana and the special interest uh, group um, at the, on, I, on intellectual property at uh, the Museum um, Computer Network. And um, there are different ways in you can engage and join our communities and we'll be providing some links in the chat box um, after uh, we finish talking. Um, uh, just a note for everyone, we have changed our um, platform for doing the uh, webinars. So now you can um, ask questions, you have a Q and answer uh, button, or you can uh, share uh, whatever you want in the side chat. Um, so you can also make the questions on the chat or on the Q&A, wherever you prefer. I'll be monitoring uh, both of them. Um, we are going to be recording and the recording will be made available afterwards alongside with a transcript. So watch out social media and regular communication channels since we'll be posting that information there. And if you have signed up with Eventbrite, um, you can expect an email from us with a transcript of the session afterwards. We're still working on the introduction to write statements transcript, but hopefully we'll have it uh, soon. Yeah. Um, so please remember that uh, while there might be lawyers in this call, um, in no way, shape or form does the content of this talk constitute legal advice. Um, if you have legal doubts, you should consult with your lawyer. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and first of all um, thank the panelists that are with us today and uh, of course introduce them. So today we have Annabel Shaw. Um, Annabel is the Copyright and Rights Assistant Manager at the British Film Institute and leads on the rights work for archive digitization and access projects. So uh, welcome Annabel and Hi. Hello. for being here with us. A um, pleasure. Great. And we also have Victoria Stobo. Victoria is a lecturer in record keeping in the Liverpool University Centre for Archive Studies. She has worked in a variety of archives, museums, libraries and galleries since 2008. Her PhD examines the ways in which copyright law affects the digitization of archive collections in the UK. Welcome, Victoria. Thanks. Um, and thanks for being here. And uh, last, we also have Melissa Levine. With us, um, Melissa is the director of the Copyright Office at the University of Michigan. Uh, Melissa was responsible for the Copyright Review Management System, an initiative to learn more about the copyright status of books in healthy trust. She's also a member of the Digital Public Library of America Working Group to promote rights statements. Uh, welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Okay, and now, Ariana, do you want to shoot the first question? <laughs> Yes, thanks, Scan. So we prepared a couple of questions for our speakers. And maybe the first one to, to know a bit more about the work that you do around, around rights clearance. So could each of you share with us what projects and in what way you've been involved in, in projects around rights clearance from either a research perspective or a, practic uh, a practitioner's perspective? Whoever wants to take the floor first is very welcome. <laughs> We're all so polite. I'll go first then. My, na my name starts with an A, I'll do that. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation to be part of this. So um, yeah, I work in the, at the British Film Institute um, and uh, the projects and things that I've been involved with over the years um, really focus around the archive digitization project. So we started in 2012 with something called Unlocking Film Heritage which was a five-year project to digitize 10,000 films from our collection and the collections of the National and Regional Archives of the UK. So these were films dating from around 1895 or so up to I think 2012 was the most recent. Um, and they were um, digitized and put into our digital preservation infrastructure at the BFI National Archive and then published on our video on demand platform, BFI Player, which is available in the UK and Ireland. Um, and it's basically accessible through a searchable map. So all these films were pinned to locations um, 
where they're filmed in the UK. Um, so my work for that project was really devising the overarching approach to how we would tackle copyright research, rights research, negotiations, um, and some risk management. Also how we dealt with orphan work, seeing as they came in sort of midway through that project. Um, currently, we're now working on a much larger project to digitise our videotape collection. So there's about 100,000 videotapes, again, from our collection and those of the regional national archives. A lot of it is television, so it's um, kind of more complicated from a rights point of view. Um, and our main access um, ambition for that is to make as many as possible, we don't really know how many, available on a new service we're developing for UK public libraries. Um, so that's kind of the work I'm involved in at the moment. Um, I, I've been involved in rights clearance more from the research side of things. Um, so my PhD looked at the digitisation of archive collections in the UK and how copyright law affects that. So I talked to a lot of archivists at institutions uh, like the British Library, Glasgow School of Art, British Film Institute. I have interrogated Annie about her right <laughs> experience activities in the past. Um, uh, and also some, uh, through other projects that I've been involved in, um, looked at some uh, approaches taken by institutions in the Netherlands, for example. So Stads Archief, uh, Rotterdam, and also the National Library of the Netherlands. Um, so I don't do a huge amount of rights clearance myself. I'm interested in how other people do rights clearance and particularly how they manage the risks um, around making archive material available online. So uh, Victoria, now I can't wait to read your dissertation. <laughs> You're probably gonna have a spike. Um, so um, to understand how I approach rights statement, rights now and rights clearances, you have to understand I've worked in this field for 30 or 20 or 30 years, and this is a, where I am now is the result of great frustration. So um, how do I approach these things? Basically, I would, I start with, uh, there's a question, I think, or a comment in the chat about provenance. I always start with what is the material? How did we get it? What are the conditions associated with it? Do we know anything about it? And much of the time is meh. You know, like, you know, a little, you know, something, you know, what's on the surface, but you, it's, you really, you, you still, even as a lawyer immersed in libraries, archives and museums, it's still really important to work with subject matter specialists, whether they're catalogers, metadata specialists, people who know about the material and how it got where it is as best as we can put it together. Um, I'm a big fan of record keeping, which would be, I guess, appropriate with our field. Um, explaining what the logic is of how we're approaching something. And I have found now that I have a, 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 his, a, a career history, I occasionally hear from people who come across a file I used, uh, yet put together 25 years ago, and it's actually helpful to them for whatever preservation project they're doing or whatever they're doing anew. So um, it is worth the time to invest in the, in the record keeping and having it in human language. Um, so I'm, I, while, while I am a lawyer and there's sort of one set of term of art and language for that kind of thing, I'm really interested in these as sort of uh, records to the file so that normal people, you know, the, the future me can understand what, what we were thinking, especially if the law changes or there need to be adjustments or maybe there's more liberal approaches. Um, so what I do is I think very immersed in my interest and love and knowledge of the institutions themselves and the people that work in them and their expertise. Um, framework sort of varies a little bit by organization and by project. And there's a lot more um, work to be across our fields, to be more interoperable, to have more consistent standards, but that is still an ongoing tr struggle. And um, I, started to understand this very early in my career, there was a project that I think ICOM did to standardize the ways uh, damage was described in, um, for couriers. And uh, so that you, you know, like crackler would be crackler, you know, the same thing. And even something that seems as simple as like a crack um, was not an easy thing to define or discuss in, in those contexts. And that was imp important for, um, insurance purposes if you were lending exhibits and moving things around. So that, 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 that 
difference in language is um, within the, even within the same language um, is is complicated and um, also exciting. So um, whether you keep your information in a spreadsheet, whatever system it is, that that I'm a little bit more agnostic about, and I and I tend to work with whatever the expertise in the organization uh, might be. Um, I could go on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I think, I think you, you mentioned a couple of things that tie quite nicely with the, the next question that we had for you. And I see there's a couple of questions in the chat, but we'll get to that in a, in a moment uh, after we dive a bit um, deeper into the topic. And so uh, another question for all of you, uh, how do you define a framework or do you base your approach in a, a standardized framework that you define or someone else defines? Um, so, any thoughts on this or Victoria as part of your research have you encountered certain frameworks that you think are useful to raise uh, to drive rights research? So the the projects that I've looked at some I mean some of them were quite early digitization projects that were taking place in the late 90s early 2000s and the archivists involved really didn't have any other examples of large-scale rights clearance that they could follow so they were sort of starting from scratch in terms of developing a framework. And what I've noticed with the projects that have come after, because a lot of those frameworks are, well, I guess by their nature, their internal documents or internal procedures that they go through. A lot of the projects that have come after that have been either like reinventing the wheel or also starting from scratch. Whereas in the last couple of years, I think as more information more guidance, more resources have been made available, more people are publishing their frameworks. I think that's really useful for all of the other institutions that maybe don't have the same resources to tackle rights clearance as other institutions. Um, and one of, one of the ones that I've seen that's been used um, fairly widely is um, the Welcome Libraries approach uh, to, to rights clearance. Um, and I've also um, seen recently that the National Library of Scotland have published their risk framework, their risk management framework for, uh, for rights clearance as well. Um, and obviously Melissa Levine's work with um, the uh, uh, Hattie Trust as well, uh, like looking at copyright as a design problem, which I think you're gonna um, talk about a bit later on. Um, and the work that Annie's done at BFI, um, I think as more of that information sort of percolates out to the cultural heritage sector, um, I think, uh, you know, archivists, curators, everyone will be a bit more confident in approaching, like developing their own frameworks that are appropriate for their own um, institutional context. Yeah, I think um, the, the Welcome Trust work on the the code breakers and it was the report i think that you did victoria with christy and and people was um was really really influential and really important for when we started working on on our unlucky film heritage project because i was scouring for is there any information out there that's going to help me um it's the first time we we took this proactive approach to actually formulate a, a framework internally about how we were going to manage this um, and lots of things kind of came up to the surface really early on. So uh, um, key things like the discrepancy across um, the organization about how people understood some fundamentals of copyright. So ownership, authorship, duration, um, duration for film in the UK is particularly mind boggling. Um, and there were so many different you know, rules that somebody had picked up from somewhere, um, lots of anecdotal um, kind of basis for saying why something was in copyright or out of copyright. Um, and, and also the first time I think we really started to build a, um, a proper framework for establishing risk. Um, and that's an ever evolving thing as well. We're constantly adding to it to sort of what things you need to consider around how you might judge something as being high risk or low risk. Um, so it's um it's yeah it's i sort of still feel it's kind of i'm a newbie in in many ways i mean okay it's now eight years on or something but there's still each project you you do have to look at it sometimes afresh because obviously you're you might be looking at very particular kinds of material and also what your end use is going to be will also determine quite a lot in terms of that risk of whether you're going for relatively low risk uses around non-commercial public access or whether you're hoping to commercialize things as well. Um, 
and also I think in terms of yeah the, the touch points you have with colleagues uh, in other departments along that workflow and and how you how you're trying to fit in the, your rights workflow with the technical work the curatorial work the um, end product sort of publication work there's all those things that how how do you make sure you're doing the right bit of work at the right time as far as possible anyway to make sure that everything's running smoothly as much as possible um, I, I can every I would completely validate everything that Victoria and Annabelle just said um, a couple things Victoria mentioned the sort of uh, reinventing the wheel about processes partly in her context I think she was referring to um, like a lack of transparency early on um, in the in these pro in these projects that is I, it's hard to say what that that may be due to just like professional practice or people weren't thinking the internet was as big as it might be um you know it was it was different i mean um i started in this area i think uh i want to say around 1995 or 6 and at that time the library of congress where i was working wasn't sure whether to go with um laser discs and cd rom copies of collections or um, provide access through the internet because this was just the cusp of when the web existed. So you still had to have dial up and dial up didn't work very well and it wasn't very widespread. So technology like sort of also shifts our social assumptions about what's possible and what's necessary. But I, I do share, um, well, I, I shouldn't say this. I have a certain frustration with the amount of new material that I see coming out that's not really new, that's maybe not very informed by past knowledge. So we, we do, I don't, I think we spend more time on certain things that we maybe don't need to worry about quite as much or that there's, somebody's already stepped through that before so you could get to the next thing. Um, I also uh, wanted to mention one of the tools that we have at the University of Michigan Library on uh, our website is a digital project proposal process, our DPP. And it, it, it's, um, I'll make sure that um, SCAN has this, the site. It's, it's actually fairly simple in terms of what it asks but it says to a curator, an archivist, or a librarian, whoever is proposing a collection, it tries to gather a certain range of information. M much of it, most of it's not legal information per se. Um, and it just gives a framework for decision-making about what is possible, what's not possible, what, how, to, how to make priorities within the organization. So um, I'm sure there's many tools like that out available, but I would encourage, um, even if you take, any one of them and tailor it to your own administrative framework, you get consistent results and consistent record keeping and it's, you can compare apples with oranges. Um, I think, I think I'm going to leave that with regard to the question about framework. I did have a question for Annabelle. Oh, yes. I um, you mentioned that some of the projects that you were dealing with are only available in the UK and Ireland. Yeah. And they sound amazing. I'd love to see them. Yeah. Um, do you, we, we have um, questions about, like there are times where we have things that are say in the public domain in the U US, but they're not abroad or what have, we have rights reversions mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. And we do have users who express some frustration. And I'm wondering whether you get, um, you know, one of the things I would love to see is sort of larger, library type exceptions for access more broadly among our collections globally even yeah. even if it were limited to i'll say qualified institutions so you had to go to a library COVID yeah. aside at the moment um i'm just curious about that access piece um if you if you can i'm sorry yeah i think um i think the decisions um they're not necessarily copyright, uh, definitely copyright plays a part in the decisions of, of uh, on what terms we're making our, our platforms available. Um, part of it, I think, is to do with the sort of focus of the mission of the British Film Institute as a UK publicly funded body. The idea is that we are 
we're publicly funded therefore the UK, UK public should be able to see their national collection and that's that's our kind of core aim um, we do make uh, subsets of what we digitize um, available on YouTube our YouTube channel um, but uh, it's an interesting in point actually in terms of the approach we took say for the Unlocky Film Heritage project which was quite a limited set of rights and we were I think deliberately quite conservative in that ask because we weren't offering any uh, any fees or royalties to rights holders and um, that uh, in some respects with hindsight, we should have asked for more from particularly those rights holders who aren't in the business of distributing films themselves. So lots of those companies that have uh, through whichever uh, history have ended up with rights to, to certain collections, they may or may not have deposited directly with us. They're not doing anything with them. Um, they may not fit anymore with their brand um, or you know any of their priorities. And it, so it seems like a slightly missed opportunity that we didn't take on wider rights back then at the time. Um, but for the purposes of the ultimate objectives, this is one of the things around the project management is you have this deadline and this, this volume of work that you have to try and clear in a certain amount of time. And so you, you want to divide it. So you, you're going to get the most positive answers from rights holders to clear it. Um, but absolutely, I think with the, with the current project and sort of thinking further ahead, um, and also I work on the, I'm a member of the Libraries Archives Copyright Alliance here in the UK, and there's lots of discussion, quite a lot of it prompted by COVID-19, about the, the major issues for access um, uh, for education and cultural heritage organisations who right now can't provide any kind of access because they can't actually get into their buildings. Um, and obviously looking at uh, what could possibly happen in terms of a new exception, expanding the current exceptions um, to make providing that access easier for the you know, cultural heritage, libraries, archives, museums. Um, and then the, um, I suppose the big question is around the, the national scope of these exceptions. And while you know, we're happy to do, um, to make things available in a certain way there is always this do you have to consider an additional risk then if you're going to make things available globally um that we don't necessarily know the ins and outs of the worldwide jurisdiction so um yeah i think there's um you know if there's sort of mous or there's certainly drivers that could be done through organizations and kind of international organizations that can help push this um, a lot of the time we sort of look across across the Atlantic and sort of uh, go why don't we have fair use and couldn't that help us all out <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> so but it's it's so it's a mixture really of some of the things around the organizational priorities about why we might make things available in a certain way um, and I would love it for us to to make more things available much more much more widely um, given the the differences around uh, domestic laws. I mean, the, the public domain issue and the sort of shorter term rule and all that kind of thing comes into it. And we quite often get people who say, well, it's in the public domain. And we go, yes, but that's over there. It's not here <laughs> necessarily. So um, yeah, there's probably more learning to do on that as well about how that all really functions. It, it's good to hear your perspective and I hope we can continue this piece and maybe more of this conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Great. Um, maybe not in front of 100 people. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can extend this call a bit later and whoever wants to stay can, can have that discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think uh, Stan and Andre, you're keeping an eye on the chat and there's a couple of interesting questions, right? Yes, um, and also, of course, like uh, if there's any information that you would like to share in like uh, cross-border exchange of works, that I think that it, that was exactly what you were talking about. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting and hot topic, I would say, for a lot of people. So, if there are like materials or anything that you would like to share on that line, um, and I'll share a couple of studies that I have too. Um, so, I want to go back to one of the questions that Christine uh, was uh, making in the chat because I think it's very interesting and it also speaks to the framework and your own process inside your institution. So, 
Christine was uh, asking, in terms of timing, uh, when to do the right bit of work at the right time with respect to your respective institutions, when does right, uh, rights assessment uh, happen? Is it based on project, funding, is it at the beginning or at the end? Are there conditions regarding rights clearance before even imagining a digitization project? I can speak to that. Um, generally speaking, I've worked very hard in the organizations that I've worked with to get the at least a preliminary rights review started bef early on or before a project to see what um, if you have something that's say everything is in copyright and everything will require permissions or a fair use assertion does the institution want to proceed? Like, because that's a certain, that's another kind of investment in an iterative way. Um, it is not unusual for us to assert fair use in many, in certain cases. Um, it is not unusual to make a preservation decision to scan things for access copies, even maybe in a reading room, but maybe beyond. Um, but I do, uh, it's, it's, it's as much a, a part of doing the preliminary work let's say you have really fragile paper and you need particular equipment it's a, it's it, it fits into that that same early planning um initially uh, like as early as possible ideally and a lot of the projects that i've looked at in my research didn't consider rights issues until after the funding had been awarded in a lot of cases um, there are examples, kind of anecdotally, of projects basically, you know, grinding to a halt because rights clearance wasn't considered at the right stage in the project. Um, so yeah, like, as early as possible, um, as Melissa said. And also in terms of, it, like, conditions with rights clearance before even imagining digitization projects, there are some funders that require certain licensing conditions to be met for the digitization output, um, which has an effect on the types of permissions that you'll be requesting as part of the rights clearance process. So for some funded projects, it does have to be built in very early. And to be fair, most funders now recognize it as an issue and they'll ask you to explore it in the, um, in the sort of during the funding uh, actual application process now. Mm. Sorry, um, no, no. <laughs> um, I mean, we've generally, certainly from an archive point of view, I mean, our, our rights team works across the archive and also we have a separate distribution collection where we are, we're a distributor and sales agent and do sort of more commercial um, work with films. But um, we're very reactive in that it's, it's driven by projects and the projects uh, um are usually con well often content driven so um i mean uh, again it would be a, a dream if we could actually do a rights-led digitization project where um those are the overarching decisions about what you what you decide to invest in but it's very unlikely to happen people don't get so excited about that um as as they do about interesting collections um and um uh one of the things that i've, I've certainly noticed is so we, we put quite a lot of effort into then devising these um, workflows and guidance for a project. We haven't really got to the point of uh, transferring that into the sort of business as usual work. So um, our archive collections, obviously, you know, they're huge. Um, we estimate we own rights in about 1% of them. We've probably done rights research on whatever, 0 point something percent of them just for these projects. Um, and if we want to get to the point of really um, having quite a sort of revolutionary change in terms of the access we can provide, we need to sort of go right back to the beginning and, and start a program that might work discreetly of, um, of tackling the, the basic kind of copyright status of collections and works alongside the donor, the donor side and any sort of donor restrictions and provenance. Um, but that again would be a huge, a huge undertaking um, to start outside of a project at this stage. I don't think that, that would be something that would be that feasible. Just a quick, quick follow-up comment. One of the things that um, 
so there are like some things that are sort of obvious that you suddenly realize in doing work that weren't obvious to you. And when I started working on the right statements project with colleagues who were in Europe who didn't have fair use and the difference between information about a work and a license regarding a work were, were two very different things. I started to realize that for me, having started this in the 90s, I'm like in the, the crowd that Victoria was talking about, um, we now have hundreds if not thousands of collections online globally that say something like, we think we have sufficient rights, we don't really know, you're on your own if you want to use or reuse. And that was really fine. And even that was even really progressive for like 20 years. But I would say 10, 15 years ago, we, we are, we're, we're, we're running into ourselves in terms of creating our own orphan work problems or exacerbating them or not being or having graduate students who aren't confident using material from online collections in their scholarly monograph. And it's sort of, it's, obvious but it's not obvious that we're we we're we've got this like next meta ecosystem that we're both that that i i would i would life's sort of short but i would love to do a project or have or work with a project that basically goes out and audits hundreds of these thousands of these and and, and it just provides feedback to the organizing mm -hmm. group there's one university that was an early participant in this kind of th thing that has medieval materials and they have that kind of statement. And I had a, a doctoral candidate who had her orals like in a week who was freaking out because she thought she couldn't use pictures of these medieval manuscripts in her dissertation. And um, there were several different countries involved in this project. It had been online for years and I contacted the university and they said, oh, you're right, we'll change it when we, whenever we do an update, which is probably not it's not it's not a priority mm. so it's a it's a project that i think we need to figure out as a community definitely mm. um i i think that there are a lot of interesting questions um in in the chat too so i'm gonna go ahead and sort of like try to mix two questions that are speaking about more or less the same um uh, question that is related to how you sort of like store or record uh, your rights uh, information and assessment data. Um, so uh, someone was asking like, um, how do you or do you recommend documenting rights information and clearances so people in the present and future can find um, clear materials? Uh, I can I can start with that one. Um, uh, it's to be honest, it's still a kind of embryonic thing I think with us. Um, so, <clears throat> how to start? Basically, for a very long time, it was um, it's kind of anecdotal, um, and there's a lot of information kept in a lot of different places. So, Excel sheets, Word documents, uh, unscanned. Uh, paperwork. We have a rights and royalties database which does hold some information about um, titles that we have sort of in active distribution. Um, we have a collections information database that would record say original credit information about the works um, in the archive. Um, but the one thing we've we've not really had is uh, what I would call any kind of central repository for the rights information um, and, and that's both across uh, the kind of usage permissions um, for archive holdings and the, the journey that a work goes through from a rights point of view. So we do have one internal document called a distributor history doc which has this information built up over many years from different colleagues about how organisations or peoples rights have traveled around, been bought, divided up, sold, rebought, divvied up, goes on and on and on. Um, what we've noticed is, well, what, what, we, what we come across is the fact that a lot of the time information is, is usually retained either in Excel or emails for a project. 
but we then struggle with how to put that information somewhere in a in a more structured way that then is available for other people to look at so you don't have to go back and start at the beginning um, the only thing we started to do right now is um, to where we where we can link a, a person's name or an organization name back to a record in our central um, our collections information database which has a unique identifier we're literally just adding a hyperlink to where that record is in the system and then have um, the name of the company that link and the narrative which is basically telling the story of what information you found in the in the latest bit of research you've had to do and then keep that updated and introducing a kind of validation um, so that you can see who the last person was to update this information and when so um, at the moment that's as far as, as we've got I would love it if we could actually move that into uh, a proper database um, at the moment it's just this Excel um, and yeah we're, we're a bit to be honest we're kind of stuck so I don't really have a recommendation other than trying to do that where you're building up some kind of system and it can be Excel where you are linking back to a, a structured data set that potentially could help you so one day you might be able to then migrate all that information into that system so it's attached to the relevant record um, yeah a lot of the projects that I've looked at range for from everything from paper files to Word documents to Excel sheets to access databases to using the collection management system that they have in so uh, like in house um a lot of collection management databases just don't have the like the granularity needed for complex rights information um that's what a lot of the um the projects that i looked at found so they ended up using basically excel sheets or word documents to record a lot of it and a lot of it does involve the like the background research involves going into like old accession records old um uh, donation records like paper files um, and starting the research from there and then sort of building on it with whatever you find online for a lot of people. Um, I think it like it needs to be scalable to the you know the institution that you work at and the resources that you have and a lot of the I guess the sort of classic thinking about it from a almost like a digital preservation point of view as long as it's in a widely used accessible format and keep it in that format you don't want to end up in a situation where all your information is in a you know a database that your institution decides to stop supporting in a couple mm. of years time that sort of thing yeah. the, the, victoria the, this 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 um this i always I've, I've started using this expression like help your future you yeah. and um even if there's the equivalent of a written finding aid, like the old fashioned states, this is what's in this box kind of thing, or um, I, I w there's a tendency, I think, for, for institutions that are concerned with memory and material memory, we're really not great about certain kinds of corporate records. So like if you're in a museum you and you have registrars, you have frequently very well organized materials but they may or may not be connected to other parts of the organization. Um, same for say catalogers in, an, in a library who aren't necessarily involved in the transactional pieces. And um, even if you have a project that has sort of four corners and a beginning and an end, even if there's a readme document that goes into some kind of permanent, it, it could be an institutional archives so that it's retained, but it is, um, I would say whether I'm dealing with an individual author or whether I'm dealing with my organization, when the, when you say, okay, what's the contract say? If it's a publishing, you know, like whatever you're dealing with, I don't have my contract or I don't know. Where, so like even just th that, that marginal additional effort of that project documentation is a, a huge step forward as we figure out how to, share that information more broadly or, or make it available for researchers who are trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, great. There's, there's 
really good questions in the chat, uh, but we want to take you to another uh, big topic that some of you have mentioned briefly, but we think it's uh, really interesting to dive a bit deeper into, which is uh, risk assessment. Um, how do you define risk assessment? If let's say you've got um, a tight budget, what information do you need to know to make decisions uh, around what to publish and what not to publish? Um, and then there's some follow-up questions that will come after that. Oh, sorry, um, and one, one quick thing. Annabelle, you mentioned this internal document where you keep the records. Uh, some people in the chat were interested in seeing it. Is there any chance you could share a template or? Um, uh, yeah, I should be able to, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be able to, to, to follow up afterwards probably and send a, yeah, send a, through a version of that. Fantastic. For sure, yeah, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, Annabelle starts with A. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Remind me again, the question was about a oh, risk mm -hmm. and the, mi the minimum amount of information you would need to start with making a risk assessment. It's kind of the thing. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, let's think. Um, well, usually, uh, it, I would try and break down um, the work that we're looking at by certain categories. So, um, the title. Title's important, <laughs> if you have that. We don't always. So, for instance, right now we're working on tapes and it just says, you know, tape, and then there's a number. We don't yet know what's actually on those tapes. So, um, title of a work, date, um, which could be date of production or date made or date released. Um, if you can have release date and production date, that's great. Um, copyright status, uh, ownership status, which actually maybe that's something you would look at a, a bit later, but hopefully you would have that. Uh, title date, copyright status, ownership status, uh, publication status. Um, those are probably the top five things. I think below that there are other things you could break it down into if you know, for instance, obviously talking about film and TV, is it, a, is it made as a uh, full broadcast or was it a film for uh, theatrical distribution? Was it a commercially produced or non-commercially produced? Um, and uh, fiction or non-fiction are really handy categories just in terms of uh, I, alerting you to the to the what kind of potential underlying rights you're going to have to be dealing with um, but I think those those sort of key bits of information you can then use those to um, just say talking about television works for instance knowing that kind of information then gives us a much clearer idea to understand under what terms of trade those programs will likely have made so would it be would it be the commissioning broadcaster likely to own rights or the independent production company what uh what the underlying clearances would have been uh, uh how they would have been cleared so usually it's quite limited so you always know you need to go back and re-clear everything um so there's the yeah those bits of information and then you kind of overlay them with the other information you're researching around the, the context of the type of material it is um when it was produced and for what reason it's produced um i think also when you for instance, the ownership uh, question might then lead you to rights holders and uh, establishing whether these rights holders are currently active, they're still in the business, whether they're quite strong in enforcing rights, do you have a relationship with them? So each one then sort of takes you on to a, a further kind of drilling down of other criteria which would help you inform the level of risk. Um, we tend to break up risk into the, the nature of the works themselves, so that the content, subject matter, um, commercial production or not, uh, relationship with rights holders and donors, um, and then the other risk factor is around the actual use you're planning for. So at the moment, we've kind of got this thing with two columns, uh, which each have a score, gives you a total score, and then you kind of come up with, is it a high, low, or medium risk? Sounds simple. <laughs> no, it's... Do you, do you mind if I jump in, Victoria? Of course. Okay. So, um, from from Annabelle was describing like sort of the all the detective work. I start with what are you doing and why. 
if you can't articulate a good reason for whatever it is you're doing, figuring out who all the rights holders might be isn't necessarily a great um, order of operation. So, so if, if, if somebody says, I'm clearing out my office, can you scan my files now that I'm an emeritus faculty? It depends, you know, and maybe it's selective and it, it's, you know, that that's maybe a delicate conversation. Um, but uh, what are you doing and why can help um, mediate where your risk tolerances are for a particular collection. Like if something is from the 1940s and it's mostly orphan works and it's in copyright, but it has really significant scholarly or current value in the US because we have fair use, I would lean towards making those materials available in some capacity. I don't know if the absence of fair use in other countries is a non-starter for other kinds of institutions who don't who don't have that and that's that's a significant thing um i also i just really quickly wanted to respond there was a question in or a comment in the comments in the chat about all the things that are not copyright so sensitive materials privacy on and on um all of those things are things they're not formally in our current process but they're all things that I screen for and look at and put a few pair of eyes on if I'm having questions because sometimes you know any one of us doesn't see issues that may be apparent to someone else. Um, so I, I do think that that is um, I this is more than copyright and it, and it should be treated that way. Um, I think Berkeley's library has a new guide I'm sorry on uh, dealing with the indigenous materials question. Victor, I just wanted to say that I would like to add a question to the question uh, for you. So, because I understand as part of your research, you had some findings around the outcomes of rights research and whether um, sometimes institutions worry a lot about taking some risks, but then the outcome is that rights holders are super happy that these works were disseminated. And I don't know if you also had some examples around that that you could share. Sure, yeah. Um, the yeah, just to agree with um, Annie and Melissa um, on those last points about um, what's the the sort of the, the the minimum that you would that you would want going into uh, rights clearance. I would also emphasise, which probably partly because I come from this from an archives background, but I'm obsessed with provenance. So the more you know about the circumstances of the creation of the item in question. In particular, I think it really goes back to um, what what we're seeing in particular, thinking about not just copyright, but the sensitivity of the material, um, whether uh, the um, you know whether it was created in the course of employment or whether it was created for like a creative commercial purpose. Um, whether it was created by an indigenous community for a specific purpose, uh, all of that. So there's, there's thinking about these things through like a, a rights-based framework, but then there's also thinking about these issues through a more sort of ethics of care approach um, and, and how you would want those materials to be treated if you put yourself in the shoes of the creator. Um, so I think that's the kind of what I, what I would emphasize is thinking about it from the, the creator's point of view as much as uh, it is about what, what we want to do with the materials and I think setting off balancing the the risks of doing something against the benefits that will accrue from doing something is really important as well. Uh, in terms of examples from my own research where um, so archivists have gone through the process of um, they've done a, a rights audit, they're doing digitization, they're contacting rights holders for permissions. Um, most of the projects uh, broke down into um, they did, where they were able to find contact details for rights holders, um, they got very close to 100% um, positive responses uh, to, to rights clearance requests. The main issues with rights clearance continue to be non-response and orphan works. But if you do actually manage to contact a rights holder, for the kinds of, for the most part, non-commercial um, sort of public good digitization that institutions are doing and most rights holders will say yes. 
Um, they also found um, that in terms of the sort of the follow up um, correspondence that they had with rights holders was that they were generally really pleased to see the material being digitized and being used for um, sort of public good purposes like uh, research or outreach and things like that. And some did actually become involved in um, sort of other projects with the institutions in question. Again, I mean, that was a, a relatively small number of institutions I found through a survey of the UK that had actually done sort of third party rights clearance at scale. And that's the that's what they were getting back uh, in terms of a response. Um, and I think uh, in particular, um, Glasgow School of Art, because they were doing the, the point at which I did research with them and their rights clearance process was in the aftermath of the fire that gutted the Macintosh building in Glasgow. Um, so I think also depending on circumstances, there will, uh, depending on, you know, sort of timing of digitization projects as well, you'll get very positive responses. Um, and people like taking an interest uh, and wanting to do like do more for the institution and off the off the back of those projects, particularly if it's um, it might be a donor that you haven't been in touch with in a while. It might be a rights holder that wasn't aware that their material was actually held by the institution in question. So it's either renewing a relationship that had maybe been um, sort of like left to um, like untended or it's like developing a new relationship with them, um, with, uh, you know, individuals that didn't realize that they were represented in the institution's collection. So there's all sorts of like unexpected uh, goodwill and like good things can happen as a result of that process. Can I respond to that? Just a, a couple things. So generally I agree with, um, like anecdotally, I think um, in the situations that Victoria is describing, pe people are generally pleased that grandma's papers exist and that there, like that there's some connection and that they're usually just pretty happy about it. There are situations that I've seen where typically it's the first generation, like the children of the creator who uh, want to assert rights. Sometimes they're willing to do sort of a joint arrangement um, frequently after they've gone to a lot of trouble of asserting those rights and working on some something that's going to make them rich. Um, after a decade or so, they realized that's not really not probably likely to happen, or they didn't understand the rights th that themselves. So they may have a product that's say commercially owned by a film company or by, and they think that as the children of, they have rights that they may not even have in the first place. Um, and there was one more thing. Um, oh, the other, if, the other thing that I'm, we're starting to see is um, current archiving practices around like recording protests and sort of active digital humanities kinds of projects where at one level we have people filming themselves and putting them on social media in a very, very public way. So what could be wrong about collecting that and making that available in some way? But frequently we have either children or People who are protesting and who could be targeted by their governments in, in, a, in, a, in a more granular way. Um, if we either have those materials or share those materials, and I, I don't think that there's an, a, uh, an answer. There's a lot of conversation about that, and it's a different uh, flavor from the kinds of things that you were uh, uh, rightly talking about, Victoria. But I think it's it's timely. Absolutely yeah and I think there's definitely a, a thread of um, I do, like I don't think people uh, owe archives their trauma. And I think archives had to have to be very careful about how they collect um, material particularly in the current um, climate. Were you right about that? <laughs> oh no I think um, I think someone has written about that. I will, um, I will try and find the link and add it to the chat, um, but that's definitely a, a strand of thought that's developing at the moment. Um, great, and we're actually reaching the uh, top of the hour. We only have uh, six minutes left, um, and I think there was a great question uh, for Annabelle. 
uh, especially oh, yeah? um, mm-hmm. around how is the um, um, British Film Institute uh, handling the orphan works registered with the European Union orphan works scheme uh, with the forthcoming Brexit uh, deadline looming? Will those works be withdrawn from the scheme <laughs> and something alternative in place? <laughs> And I think this I, is a good I, question for Melissa too, because like the orphan work situation is like so different across the Atlantic too that there's like something to be said around that. Yeah, I have a fe- I have a feeling this question came from uh, my former colleague Emma Cook, who did most of the diligent searches for the Unlucky Film Heritage Program. So she has a vested interest to know what we're going to do. Um, so yes, uh, what's the plan? At the moment, um, I don't think there's any plan for the BFI to remove any of the works, uh, registered orphan works with the EU IPO from our player platform or from our, we have a special uh, YouTube playlist of about 170 of the 270 odd orphan works that we've registered. Um, We've, uh, I think, basically on the calculating it as a pretty low risk, in that they've been up there for quite a long time. We carried out um, very good due diligence when we registered them. Uh, we haven't had claims. Uh, I think we might have had one person who kind of came out and said, oh, I think this might be mine. Um, and so I don't see that we would make any change in terms of how we're making them available. Um, but what's going to happen after that? I'm not sure. Uh, at the moment, the BFI has never made use of the UK licensing scheme. Um, I am involved in the uh, Endow Community Project, which is the, uh, for those who don't know, there's the, the diligent search tools, you can look at diligentsearch.eu, which has um, a tool to help people do a diligent search. Um, and uh, the current project is basically to try and get the public uh, engaged in this and helping, so crowdsourcing uh, the diligent search. And where we've put forward a, a list of about, I don't know, I think there might be at 30 films or something we've put on there, mm-hmm. sort of waiting for people to do that. If the diligent search is carried out and yes, it is an orphan, uh, we would then probably put them through for the UK licensing scheme. Um, I've never gone end to end doing that application process. And obviously there are then costs uh, involved in making an application and getting the license from the UK IPO. Um, it's uh, it's kind of it's painful in a way. I mean, given the amount of work we we invested in, you know, incorporating the orphan works um, work into our workflows for unlucky film heritage, the uh, the way it actually helped raise the profile of rights research in particular, which is a an area that certainly at the BFI I think is still. It's in a sort of chrysalis phase in terms of how it's viewed um, as an important part of what the organization does. It's yet to become the beautiful butterfly, I know it can be. Um, but we invested all that, we put these things out there on the EU IPO um, and then their life may be quite short, which I think is kind of heartbreaking. Um, so uh, whether the UK itself will, uh, will agree to introduce its own exception, I don't know. I, I'd hope that something would be done um, to allow allow there to, for us to continue to make these things available and not necessarily sort of push us down the route of having to go through the licensing scheme. We'll see. Yeah, and, um, um, unfortunately, we only have two minutes left. And, yes. <laughs> and there was uh, someone that asked um, about books and resources. So, um, like books or, or resources around like copyright clearance. So, when we publish the transcript, we are probably going to include like um, some of the links that were shared now in the chat, and also some uh, further readings that you can go to um, and read more about this. Uh, of course, like the uh, resource put by Melissa, the Copyright Management System Toolkit is probably one of the best resources that you can find uh, to around this. Um, yeah, so um, we're at the top of the hour. Any final comments, thoughts, or reflections that you want to make uh, to close the conversation? I, 
am fine with and encourage people to email me because there are a lot of um, valuable products out there, um, but it gets a little bit overwhelming. And I am interested in writing something, but I don't. I also don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I feel like the sort of long lists of sort of wiki style resources are super helpful, but it's a lot to dig into. And um, I'd, I'd like to, to figure out something that's more conversational in tone for people. And I'd also like to work on writing about, these are, these end up being really rarefied topics and it's like good to be with our family, our, <laughs> our collection glam family, but normal people need to understand why all of this is important and why these institutions are important to, to um, support them. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking it through some projects and would really welcome any thoughts about that kind of audience. And thank you. Um, to say, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. I can't believe how quickly the time went. So I'm sure we could carry on for hours and hours um, on more conversations. So I'm um, absolutely would love to to carry on conversations with lots of people here, and um, and as much as possible, we, you know, I'm planning to share information on the, the the work we're doing now on the current project. So hopefully, to let other people see how we're trying to deal with some of these some of these issues. So I look forward to the next time. <laughs> Same here, I would be interested in continuing the conversation um, and also putting sort of lists of resources together. Um, there is the Copyright Cortex, which uh, is a kind of database of uh, research um, tools and sort of guidance around uh, rights issues for cultural heritage institutions. I don't know whether we have anything specific for rights clearance that's really comprehensive, but there's definitely um, sort of areas of research that have picked up on it in the past um, and we could we could probably pull together a, a sort of guide of some resources that people might find useful. Great, so well I think we've reached the end of the webinar. Um, I think it's quite clear that we might need to have a rights clearance part two webinar so we'll look into that and I'd just like to thank you all for being here. It was, it's always extremely interesting for all of us. Also, I think I can speak on behalf of Scan and Andrea uh, to listen to all of you. So thank you all and uh, see you next time. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye.